Okay, we're ready to go. It's already 2.35 on the East Coast, um, apparently. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this future incubator training uh, today, uh, May 11th. It will be 2022. We'll be talking about intellectual property 101 for nonprofits. Um, I will make this introduction very short, uh, and I will hand it over to John Halski, uh, who will introduce himself and get right into the thick of it. I will say that this session is being recorded and will be available uh, for projects after the fact. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can email futureincubator at wearemarchon.org. And with that, I'll hand it over to John, who is going to take it away and leave time at the end for questions. Thanks. Thanks, Penelope, and thanks for inviting me to do this. This is uh, this is fun. This is the sort of thing I really like doing. Uh, <clears throat> so, yes, my name is John Halske, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so, I live in Seattle, um, seemingly half in the light and half in dark. I seem to keep coming in and out of uh, <laughs> my window, from what I can tell. Uh, something about the light balance here, uh, but I'm. Uh, of counsel in the trademark group here at Ryan Swanson in Cleveland. Uh, I've been practicing law since about 2006, and I've been focused on trademark and copyright law since 2013. Um, just to give you a range of the sort of clients that I have uh, uh, advised in the IP realm, uh, it's included presidential campaigns, or some global nonprofit organizations, but also a lot of early stage charities, uh, startups and both profit in the nonprofit space, but you know, really companies of all shapes and sizes and on, on both sides of the profit and the for-profit, uh, for-profit nonprofit line. Um, and last thing I'll say about me personally is I love chatting and I love talking about these issues. So, you know, I hope that there's opportunities after today for us to connect, you know, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, talk about any questions that have come up, any issues that face, you know, you or your endeavors uh, on a more, you know, direct level. Um, just backing up a sec, I, I did name this the Branding the Movement Intellectual Property for Nonprofits uh, webinar. Um, just a note on that, uh, th that title notwithstanding, uh, most of what I'm going to talk about today would really apply equally to both for-profits and nonprofit organizations. I'm going to call out issues as I go that may be more relevant or raise certain distinct concerns for a nonprofit. Uh, but at any point in this webinar, if I talk about companies, businesses, you know, use terms like use and commerce, uh, just know that, you know, as far as the law is concerned, there's not always much distinction made between a for-profit and a non-profit as far as their intellectual property rights go. So just know that, that none of the, all, all of that is going to, you know, likely apply to you. And I'll call out even there are situations where it might apply to you differently. A uh, few other disclaimers up here in the top. I'm going to strongly encourage everybody to speak up to drop in comments, to you know, raise questions as we go. Uh, I think these things are always more fun when they're a little more conversational than you know, pure lecture. Uh, but you know, it's been said now, I think you've been, it's been flagged a couple of times. Uh, I'll say it too, that uh, keep in mind this presentation is being recorded. Uh, it's being recorded and intended for you know, reuse uh, by March on. So you know, note that your comments, your voice uh, may be recorded as well. Uh, and just you know, as far as sharing information, things that might be confidential or sensitive. Uh, I would just say just, you know, anything you say here may be heard by others outside of the immediate group. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, next thing I want to say, as far as a disclaimer goes, um, what I'm about to say in this lecture is not what, it, what I would designate legal advice. Uh, it is information. Uh, it's drawing from publicly informational, public, publicly available sources. Uh, but you know, as far as you know, seeking the legal advice of an attorney, that would be a different kind of conversation uh, that we would have. Third thing I'll say, the outcome of any legal dispute is going to be the result of a lot of different, very fact-specific factors. So while I might describe some situations that have occurred and talk about how they turned out, none of that is going to be predictive necessarily of what would happen in your situation, even if the facts were very similar, there can still be a lot of nuances that you know, alter the, the outcome from one matter to the next. So you know, don't take anything as a given or for granted simply because that's the way it occurred in some you know, other situation because the facts up under a microscope might differ in ways that change the outcome considerably for you. 
Lastly, I want just wanted to say that in any analysis of any situation, there's going to be at least two big angles to consider. And one angle is going to be the legal analysis, the legal, the likely legal outcome if we actually ran, got into a dispute, if rubber hits the road and you're in the court or you're before the trademark office. Uh, and we can talk about, you know, an attorney should advise you on what the likely legal outcome is in that situation. But in every situation, there's also a practical analysis that you have to consider as well. That is, will this actually result in a dispute? What is actually going to happen uh, in the real world and whether or not you know, the law says that X, Y, or Z should happen, that's not necessarily how things occur in real life. So the way I'm with, the, the, the example I'm going to give you as a framing device is driving on the highway. Now, you need to get from point A to point B, and that's going to be your goal. And highways will have, in most cases, in most states, a speed limit posted on the sign. And once you're actually on the highway, you do want to keep an eye on your speedometer, and then you make some judgment calls about how fast you're going to go. And you're going to look around you, consider the cars around you, and probably keep up with the flow of traffic and make sometimes a judgment, a risk analysis in your own situation that you're going to go above the speed limit and risk the possibility of you know, not just an accident, so not just a, a crash or fatality, but a speeding ticket. Now, if you went to an attorney before you went on the road and said, hey, can I break the speed limit? The attorney, you know, as a matter of law, is when I say, well, no, I can't tell you that it's permitted to go above the speed limit. I can tell you what the consequences will be if you do, and you're in a situation or in a, an area where there is a lot of police activity, it's likely you're going to get a ticket, and that's the outcome, and there's also going to be these safety risks you have to consider as well. But that's going to be the difference between understanding what the law says about the situation and understanding what the practical realities in real life will be for you once you're actually on the road. So just keep in mind that those are two distinct analysis, analyses to consider in any situation. So with that all behind us, let's dive in. So part one I've titled, How to Trademark Your Copyright at the Patent Office and Everything Wrong with That Sentence. What I hope you take away from this, if nothing else, after this webinar is over, is some vocabulary, some basic idea of the, the buckets of intellectual property and where your intellectual property might fit in those buckets. So you might come up to me, and I've had this happen where people approach me, they call me, they're, you know, we're, in a, we're in an attorney client privileged phone call, and they tell me about their great idea and how they wanna protect their great idea. And I gotta tell you right out of the gate, how do you protect your great ideas? Well, you, you can't. You can't protect an idea if that's all it is. If it's, you know, a flash of inspiration, you woke up from a dream, where, who knows where the ideas come from? You have this amazing idea and you want to make sure that you lock that down and protect it so that no one else uses your idea. Until it is manifest in some form, an idea is ephemeral, it comes and goes. But you can protect a patent. And patents come in two basic categories. So a patent is an invention. There is, there is a utility patent, which is an invention, which is a non-obvious and novel invention that has proper enablement. Enablement meaning that in a patent application, you have described what the patent is, you have laid out enough instructions that someone in that field could build, could recreate what you have done, and you'll have illustrations such as this that show you what the product ought to be once the invention is fully assembled. It can be both a device, it can be a, as well as a method, a new method for swinging a golf club could be a patentable invention. But again, you're going to have a description, you're going to have enablements, you're going to have written claims and illustrations to help bring that idea to some life, to some form. Now, the other category of patent, less common, is a design patent. And just to cover that briefly, it basically means some non-utilitarian ornamentation or configuration that is new, that hasn't been filed or uh, submitted to the patent office before. So in that case, yes, you can get some protection for things like a bottle, a, sh a bottle shape, or a shoe shape that doesn't have any sort of function that is simply for aesthetics. A more common along those lines that you may be thinking of is, uh, that, that might bring to mind, is a copyright. Now, copyright is the, ex the protection given to an expression of an idea that is something original, of having minimal creativity 
that is fixed in a tangible medium. So let's give an example. Let's say you come to me with this great idea. And your idea is a story in which a boy and a girl meet, fall in love, discover that their families are at war with each other, but they pursue their love anyways. And through a series of miscommunications and misadventures, they elope and then each commit suicide in a tragic end. Now, the idea that I just described is Romeo and Juliet. And Romeo and Juliet, as a play written in paper and performed on stage, had a copyright, presumably. I don't know what the law of England was at the time, but William Shakespeare had rights to that expression of that idea for a time. He died. And then the copyright ran out, whatever the copyright term was under the law at the time. And now it's in the public domain. Once things enter the public domain, free to use. So let's say a director in the 90s picks up that public domain material and sets it in modern times. He gives it a bang and soundtrack. He gives it some fancy uh, uh, set designs and cinematography. He adds new characters or at least new interpretations of those characters. And suddenly you have a new copyright and a, and a layered copyright on top of the public domain that gives Baz Luhrmann in this case and the studio behind it the rights to that version of the story. But that doesn't stop another studio from putting out an animated version featuring garden gnomes, Gnomeo and Juliet, with its own copyrights attaching to what they added to the story. It doesn't stop trauma productions from putting out Tromeo and Juliet. As many variations on the story you can think of, each building off of the material in the public domain, each having its own distinct copyright because it's the expression fixed in film that is protected. Now, another form of intellectual property, very important to, to, to this discussion, is trademark. Now, trademark is a, you know, in formal terms, a source indicator that is used to let consumers know where the goods and services they are acquiring come from. So it doesn't really matter who designed the Disney logo. Trademark law isn't concerned with the author, the creator. Copyright, yes. Trademark, no. They don't really care. We don't know who. Presumably, that's Walt Disney's signature. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that when you see that logo, you know that whatever it's affixed to is coming from the Disney company or has the Disney company seal of approval. So if it's a licensee, they have the license permission to do so. To use that Disney logo. And it is a sign of quality, you know, for good or for bad, <laughs> whatever you think of the Disney product line is, you know, it's a matter of opinion. But it'll meet those standards. Same with the Nike swoosh. Minimal design may not be eligible for copyright protection and maybe too minimal, but you know when you see the Nike swoosh that you're getting a product from the Nike company or you're getting a counterfeit, you're getting an infringing product, in which case you know, Nike is obliged to you know, enforce their rights to stop the, the misuse of their logo because it's the consumers who are going to be harmed by thinking that they're getting a Nike product when they're not. It can be a single note, a chime that starts when you uh, turn on your computer that tells you it is a Mac product. It can be minimal, unlike copyright, which has to have some substance to it. A trademark can be very basic. Next category I want to talk about in the intellectual property buckets is identity. There's intellectual, pro intellectual property rights in your name, in your likeness, nicknames, ways that people identify you, things that you're known for. The point being that you have some control over the use of your name likeness and, uh, and other identifying information in commerce. And this is going to be true even for President Obama, one of the most famous faces in the world. And you might be thinking to yourself, hey, I, I can put him on a t-shirt. I can put him on a sign. I can put him in an article. I can, I can use his image because, he's a, he, because being the president means that you're subject to public comment and public criticism. Being a famous person, don't you give up some kind of privacy? And yes and no, First Amendment rights will be very strong over the use of identifying the president for commentary purposes. But in this case, it went on a billboard implying the president's endorsement of a product. And the White House, this was back in I think 2010, uh, complained to the company that they didn't authorize the use of the president's uh, face and likeness. And uh, through settlement, it was taken down. In this case, uh, some years back before then, a robot that very closely resembled 
a famous person, Vanna White, triggered a lawsuit, went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ultimately didn't decide on it, uh, didn't, didn't hear the case, but it ended up settling, uh, netted uh, Vanna White or her you know, representatives uh, some money out of the situation. Uh, but it came out of uh, California where they were testing a new right of privacy law at the time, right of publicity law, uh, that according to you know, Vanna White's attorneys, covered a representation that people would assume was Vanna White, and that implied some endorsement of, of the personality for uh, uh, Samsung products. Now, you may be accustomed to seeing this signage if you're in New York, Atlanta, anywhere where there's a lot of filming taking place. That is the, the, the purpose of signs such as this, of our, of our disclaimer at the top of the video giving people notice that they may be recorded, that their name, their, their voice may be captured. Now, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but the tricky thing about right of publicity is that it is a state law granted right. So unlike what we talk about trademarks and copyrights, we won't, we won't get into patents, but that would apply as well, are federal in nature uh, that have certain you know, meets and bounds that we can talk about on a 50 state basis. Right of publicity and privacy being state law indicates that the state you are in is going to determine how best to navigate right of publicity laws. That makes it very tricky and very fact specific. So something that you know I can only generalize about so much in the course of this lecture, but something for you to just keep in mind as we move on from here is that if you are involving the name, the voice, the face of anyone outside the organization, even internally, internally to the organization as well, but in particular people who are, may not be involved in what you're doing, you wanna make sure that you are clearing those rights in some form or another, and that's gonna require fact-specific analysis about how much clearance you require. The last one I'll touch on just around the basis is trade secrets, and that's a term you may have heard as well. Uh, the, the, secret to a, <laughs> the secret sauce to a trade secret is, is right in the name itself. It is a trade you know, method, some sort of information that you are applying to what you are doing that gives you some sort of advantage. Now, in your case, you know, maybe it's a fundraising method. You're, you're, you're licking envelopes in a way that's different from your from, uh, other organizations. Um, the, 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 the second key piece to that, though, is that it is a secret. So here we're talking about, you know, are there NDAs involved? Are you taking special security tech, you know, tech security measures to make sure that what you're doing behind closed doors stays there? And by doing so, you know, by keeping this a secret to yourselves, you have an advantage over others. And the, the trade secrets infringe, it comes into play if someone you know, spills the beans, if someone discloses that information to someone that by some contract with them, they were not permitted to do, or someone hacks into your system and pulls information out that then you know, negates whatever sort of advantage you had by keeping it secret. Now, unlike trademarks, copyrights, and patents, these are things you don't register. That would defeat the purpose. Filing it in public would mean it's no longer a secret. Now, the giant caveat, the asterisk after all of these things is going to be that you can protect you know, inventions, expressions, trademarks, your identity, certain trade secrets, sometimes. The First Amendment is going to be the catch-all umbrella that is, you know, that pushes back against these monopolies. And that's what they are. They're monopolies granted by the government that allow you to control the use of certain manifest, uh, manifest ideas. And the First Amendment pushes back and says, well, yes, but with certain limits. Yes, except in certain situations. Now, the one thing I just want to say about this, and we'll, we'll pepper this throughout the, the rest of the lecture, uh, First Amendment examples, is that First Amendment's defenses are exactly that. They are defenses. So once you're in the position that you want to say, hey, I, I, I want to use someone else's IP. I want to use some other you know, copyrighted material. I want to use someone's trademark. At that point, you have to assume that you are in the position of the infringer, that you're the defendant, that someone has a credible accusation against you that you are infringing their rights, and now you roll out the defenses. So it is not that you ever had permission to do so. It is that having gotten caught, <laughs> you have a shield to protect, to protect you against the liability of the infringement. So, you know, just it's, 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 maybe it's a nuance, but it's something just to keep in mind that these things are not quote unquote permitted. They are defensible. And there's a, there's a legal distinction there. So 
going to take a little breath breather here to clear my throat, give anyone a chance to ask any questions, but we're going to dive in next to a deeper dive into, uh, into trademark. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about what constitutes a protectable trademark. And I'll put the emphasis on a protectable trademark. Uh, first off, a protectable trademark is going to be distinctive. We'll talk more about what that means in a little bit. Second of all, it has to be something available. Uh, so, you know, what goes into availability? Well, first you have to have priority. Uh, the big rule for trademarks is, you know, first one in wins, uh, you know, all other things being equal. You wanna be the first person using a particular trademark that puts you in the senior position. That's where you wanna be. And it's going to be determined by the goods and services that you're offering. So I'll hammer this example again, probably two or three times more, but, you know, if you know anyone in law school, if you've been in law school yourself, if you've ever talked to a lawyer, they might mention that they do some of their legal research on Lexus. Lexus being one of the brands for a trademark research service uh, provided online. I guess they have a print edition too now, who cares? Um, and there is at the same time, a Lexus automobile brand. So there being a Lexus legal research service and a Lexus automobile company is perfectly fine because the average consumer is not going to be confused when they're going to get a car or if they're going to get, you know, online legal research that they might, you know, that there's, that there's going to be no, there's going to be no notion in the person's head that the two might be coming from the same source. So with there being, just by trademark rights being defined by the goods and services you offer is a critical, is a critical uh, aspect of trademark availability. Third critical aspect is geography. Trademark is always de determined, trademark rights are always determined by where you are operating. First as a jurisdictional matter. So, you know, if you have trademark rights fully locked up in the United States, that doesn't mean anything to Canada. Doesn't matter, you know, how close you are to the Canadian border. The trademark rights you acquire here are here. And if you wanna see trademark rights in Canada as well, in the EU, in China, and we got to think about, well, what does it take to establish your trademark rights on a country by country basis? And then secondarily, even within the United States, the geography can matter quite a bit if you're not registered. And we'll talk about registration in a bit. But if you're simply using your trademark, what we call a common law trademark, then the fact that you are operating solely in California, let's say, could mean a lot. It could mean that your rights are not established in New York. If you don't have presence there, if you're not advertising, if you're not reaching donors and donors aren't reaching you. As I just mentioned, trademark rights are drawn from use. They may be registered, and there's good reasons to seek registration, good sometimes good reasons not to, but your trademark rights in the United States at least, not true in every country, but in the United States, they're gonna start with use. So. You launch a new trademark today on your website, on printed materials, on merchandise, you can put a TM after it. You can call it your trademark. You can put a little disclaimer language at the bottom of your website, such and such as the trademark of so-and-so. You are making a common law claim that that trademark belongs to you based on the goods and services you're offering, based on your priorities that mark, no one else has it to your knowledge, in the geography in which you are using the trademark. A valid enforceable or valid protectable trademark is an enforced trademark. Now, much as you can lose trademark rights by ceasing to use the trademark, you can also lose your trademark rights if you don't prevent others from using your trademark in a confusingly similar manner. Quick point here, trademarks can be assigned. They are a property, they are a thing that can be moved from point A to point B. Uh, they can also be licensed. Now, the key point on licensing it, though, is this quality control concept. Now, the, the, the important thing to remember here is that if you have a trademark, you're confident in your trademark rights, you want to extend those trademark rights to somebody else to use, whether or not they, they attribute that use back to you. The critical point is that you have some mechanism of controlling the quality of what the licensee is doing. Without it, that's called a naked license. If you just give someone permission to use your trademark and you have no eyes on what they're doing, you have no written agreement in place that says, hey, if you don't do X, Y, or Z, or if you don't meet certain standards, then this license will become void. Then should that come to light, 
you can therefore have negated your trademark rights since the public no longer has any sort of you know, standard of quality to measure the use of the trademark against. And then the catch-all caveat at the end, I'm hearing this a lot from me, everything I just said is limited by the First Amendment. So what are you getting with the trademark? Well, above all, you're getting prevention of consumer confusion. And I like to think of trademarks as a consumer right. It's the consumer's right not to be confused. When you see the golden arches, you're going to get a Big Mac. And whether or not the Big Mac is your thing or not, you know what you're getting when you buy it. And what comes back is, you know, a bag full of glass shards. Well, because you weren't going to McDonald's, you're going to a McDougal's or something, then you were confused and you suffered for it. Unauthorized association. So just quick point on this. The point of having a trademark is that if someone else says, you know, I am who I am and I am endorsed by so-and-so, or I'm affiliated with this person, or this person uh, and I are working in collaboration, and that is not the case, well, it's your trademark rights that allow you to send that cease and desist letter and get results. Get those things taken down, get the reference to you removed, get clarification. Likewise, with counterfeit goods and services, uh, I will also say on this point, dilution and disparagement, this may not apply in all situations. It kind of depends on you know, the, the circumstances, the fame of the trademark, but it may be that your trademark is suddenly associated with by someone else with something unsavory. Let's say, I don't know, like they, they start selling cannabis products, they start you know, selling a, using your name in connection with an adult bookstore, Things that might be perfectly legal and perfectly, you know, you know, fine, all things considered, but your brand being associated with something like that can, you know, from some perspectives, tarnish the value of that brand. And then again, trademark rights come in, and that is what we use or what we assert to try to put a stop to it. Now, a couple of things to note: it does not prevent something. What's called? Oh, I see a question here. Um, question on this point: disparagement. Um, can you elaborate? I'm not sure what the question is. Anyway, I might go on, but if you if you if you, if you can elaborate on that question, I'll try to address it. Um, the trademark rights don't prevent others from using your trademark correctly. So if someone is using your mark to identify you, that is going to be basically proper trademark use, even if you haven't authorized them to, you know, put their name and put your name in their mouth. Um, okay, thank you so much. This is um, oh, yes. a really good point. Um, what I meant to say when on the point of disparagement, which I just realized that I misspelled, I've only had one cup of coffee today. Um, <laughs> so our organization, our group, um, our project has created this initiative called Boober. And it's a, well, I'm not going to bore everybody with what it is. But anyway, it is unique in that what it does. But if you say Boober, um, I worry about people, we want to trademark it because it's something that could also be monetized and licensable and, you know, replicated in other states. But I worry about the disparagement of Uber with something that, because it has nothing to do with, um, with adult porn or porn period or boobs other than breastfeeding. How would we protect something like that or would trademarks protect that, I guess is the question. Um, as in, so people, as in other people using that same name in order to connect it to things that are like, uh, you know. A, yeah, because what it is, it's a, it's a um, breast pumping uh, program or project for incarcerated individuals. And it's mm -hmm. a delivery service in addition to all the training and everything else that we do. Um, and so again, it's catchy, people like it. I love to see people's expressions when I say the word boober, but again, it wouldn't be a long stretch before somebody wants to just do something and attribute it because boober, although we do spell it in a way that is not traditionally spelled um, by design, um, I worry about people making that connection and hijacking it, I guess. Well, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. These, or, or these thinking it. These categories of infringement of dilution disparagement. I mean, they, they typically they they tend to be limited to famous what we call famous marks. So you know the 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 idea being that uh, like like your Disney's and your Coca Colas are so well known to the point and 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 offer goods and services you know beyond. 
any, any, any single category uh, or have wide licensing programs that the average consumer might draw some connection between the use of that mark and some product and at least question like, oh, wow, Disney is Disney has a licensed cannabis line, you know, so that, that, that sort of thing. So when it is when it, when it falls short of that, when it's effectively a new brand, um, then you're kind of stuck with, I think, more typical likelihood of confusion analysis. So, you know, the the the, the idea being um, uh, and, unless consumers have already built enough of an impression of your brand, then this, you know, use of the brand with some distinct category of goods and services may not strike them as confusing, particularly if it's in an industry that is known to have, known, known to really use a lot of, you know, parody marks and a lot of, you know, play on words, um, then your ability to prevent that from occurring might be pretty narrow. Okay. Um, so I'm now less concerned about disparagement and dilution as I am about commentary and criticism, which, well, just because of the constituency lends itself to commentary and criticism. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, just as a, as a First Amendment point, you know, uh, trademarks don't allow you to prevent people from talking about your brand or making comments, posting reviews, you know, uh, for, for good or for bad. Um, Non-confusing use by others is actually kind of what we just talked about. There can be use by others that is, you know, of, of, of identifying products. I mean, this is the Lexus example again, that, you know, car companies and legal research services are not related services. So use by one is non-confusing with the other. Uh, and then the last one I'll just call out here is non-trademark use by others, which might also touch on uh, Kimberly's comment that, um, you know, I'm going to use a different example, which is a little more clear cut. But if, you know, Apple Inc. has very strong and well-established rights to the term Apple for laptops, doesn't prevent anyone from using Apple to describe the fruit. Uh, they have absolutely no right to prevent you from identifying apples by their name. So go ahead and try to skim this part quickly and make sure we, we cover at least, you know, the, uh, the, the, the trademark and copyright portions here. Um, point I want to stress here is that anything, almost, almost anything, uh, hypothetically, can be a trademark. So registrations have been issued for a color, for the color pink as applied to this tape product. Now, you know, that, that tends to get overblown when, it, when, you know, the press reports on these sorts of things. No company owns the color pink, but they can own rights to use the color pink on a particular product if they've shown through enough use that consumers know that pink tape comes from a specific seller. It can be, uh, and this uh, touches, I guess, something I'm very hot in the news today on things like uh, Disney's uh, motion mark, in this case, the animation of Mickey for, uh, for, for trademark right purposes. So even if that clip there no longer has copyright protection, which all things eventually do lose their copyright protection, that's just a you know, law of nature, basically, trade, uh, Disney can apply for trademark registration and have gotten a registration for that image because it is used in connection with, you know, as, as, the, as the credits, as the, the prelude to a Disney film. It can be a smell. A registration has been issued for the smell of mint applied to bowling balls. Cause I guess they've established that when you smell a minty bowling ball, you know, it's coming from minting bowling ball co. I have actually no idea who the, the owner of that mark is. Um, but the point is that, that when you are thinking about your brand, important to think about all aspects of the brand. They can all help to identify who you are in the eyes of the consumers. Uh, and they can all, you know, if, if used correctly, it can be protectable. But having said that, not everything is a trademark. And I want to spend a little bit of time here on this point. We're going to talk about the spectrum of potential trademarks uh, from descriptive to distinctive. And there being two outer edges here on the left will be things that simply cannot function as trademarks. And on the right, things that almost certainly going to be strong trademarks. On the left now, we're going to talk about generics, a generic term that is basically the dictionary definition of what something is, can never be a trademark, at least not for the product itself. So here the example is cherry for fruit, generic, cherry is a fruit. You can sell cherries, you can describe them as cherries, you can't stop other people from calling cherries cherries. Now you come to me and say, well, no, no, actually it's not, it's not the fruit that I'm selling. It's a cherry flavored candy. It's like, well, okay, okay, okay. So cherry isn't 
candy, it's fruit. So there's already a step removed there. So what you're talking about is something that is descriptive, but in this case, it is very descriptive. Cherry candies are very common, and the average consumer will buy a you know cherry gummy bear or a, a cherry you know fruit loop or cherry you know, gum whatever, and they won't expect all those cherry products to come from the same source. But they'll understand that it's a descriptive term, so it's going to be very hard, not maybe not impossible for a descriptive term, depending on how descriptive, how commonly used it is. But it's going to be a tough hill to climb to get a registration for a descriptive term. Then you say, well, you know, we, we moved away from candy. We're getting into cosmetics. Well, okay, okay. Um, if I go to the pharmacy today, you know, I go to the cosmetic store, I, I don't buy a lot of lipstick, but I imagine that I could probably find a dozen or so different cherry brand, you know, cherry lipstick colors as a, as a common use for the color red. So I'm going to cheat here a little bit. I'm going to misspell it a little bit. Okay, so now we're taking a few steps away from the product. Now I've, I've, I've misspelled the term. You might fall into a, what's called a suggestive category where consumers can sort of connect the dots, but they gotta do a little bit of work. They gotta do a little bit of, of uh, you know, connecting the dots to get from cherry to lipstick. But let's say, you know, cosmetics just wasn't working out. So we're gonna get into computers. Let's say we're gonna take a silhouette of a fruit. Now we're talking about arbitrary trademarks and these are pretty good. These are gonna be easy sells at the trademark office because a cherry is not a laptop. It doesn't describe the color or the flavor or the smell. Uh, there's nothing that consumers associate between the two. Uh, that is the sign of a good trademark, but there's a stronger trademark you can identify. And that is a fanciful trademark. That is a made up word. Uh, in this case, I took the term, you know, just keep it on theme. I spelled cherry backwards. I wouldn't know how to pronounce that. Was it Uric? I mean, there's no uh, consumer association between that made up term and anything in the universe. So as trademarks go, you know, it's the least attractive maybe out of everything on the screen, but it's going to be the strongest from a trademark perspective because there's no descriptive element to it. Now here we've got to big, put a big asterisk. We've got to talk a lot about uh, slogans, political slogans in particular. And this is something that is going to be pretty, uh, pretty, pretty unique to the nonprofit space. The trademark office recently uh, has been issuing more and more what are called failure to function refusals. Uh, and those, it's, it's a little bit different than all the different types of refusals I just talked about. Generic, merely descriptive, all of those things. The idea instead is, let's say, keeping on theme, that a movement comes together that loves cherries, that thinks that cherries should be you know, subsidized by the government, given out for free, you know, whatever. Um, and let's say that this slogan comes out of the ether. Cherries for days, I just came up with that. Doesn't matter where it came from necessarily. Could have been a single hashtag, a Facebook post. It might have sprung up uh, organically from five or six different sources. It might have historical roots, some 1920s cherry movement that's become revived or you know, re rediscovered. The point is that if an examiner at the trademark office can find that phrase being used by many different people from many different sources, or finds a Wikipedia article describing the Cherries for Days movement in a, in a non-trademark sort of way, they may declare that it fails to function as a trademark and take it out of, out of consideration for possible registration. And that's gonna be true regardless of, of, of what products you're providing, what goods or services you're offering. The failure to function refusal is a beast. It is very difficult to overcome at the trademark office. So if you find that you're attracted to a slogan because you're seeing it everywhere, because it has caught on, because there's a movement behind that slogan, guys, guys you're going to have to scratch your head a little bit and talk to an attorney uh, about whether or not that can be registered, whether or not that can be claimed uh, exclusively, or if that is a term that has reached a certain point that you have to expect that not just you, but other people can use it as well, and no one's going to have exclusive rights to use it and adjust your branding accordingly. Now I want to move on to talk about, let's say you've got your trademark in mind, you've determined that it's available, you think it's not going to have a failure to function issue, you think you're in good shape, then it's time to actually build and establish your trademark rights. Your trademark rights don't come from creation, that's a copyright. As soon as it's down on paper, the copyright applies. Trademark rights come in through use. Now, what constitutes use? Here, I'm gonna pick on the ACLU. Use can be website letterhead. It can be on social in your social media accounts. It can be in advertisements. It can appear on merchandise. It can be on your goods, on 
product tags, product packaging. It can be on letterhead. It can be on the letters that go out to your members or your donors, your solicitations. But a few things that you want to be careful about, what it cannot be or what cannot, what, what, what by itself doesn't qualify are some counterintuitive things. Like let's say you have your domain name secured. Great, great. No, that's a good thing. And once you have a, a trademark in mind, you want to look to see what .orgs, .coms, .nets are available. And let's say you purchase your domain name, maybe it costs 50 bucks, maybe it costs 5,000 bucks, doesn't matter. The domain name by itself is not trademark use. It secures you no rights whatsoever, except the rights to use that domain name. Likewise with social media accounts, you might have a Facebook page up, but if that Facebook page hasn't been updated in five years or 10 years, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty, uh, a pretty weak case to be made. Another one is ornamental designs. Now this one's a little bit tricky. This one ends up, uh, this, can, this is a real trap door for some people. Merely putting a, a, a logo or a word on a t-shirt or perhaps even a sign or a tote bag by itself may not be trademark use because consumers are very accustomed to seeing logos and slogans slapped on t-shirts and don't necessarily assume that that means that that, that, that that says anything about where the shirt came from. Remember that trademark is about source. So, you know, on the shirt is, isn't bad. It's, it's, not, it's not bad use. It's, 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 good. it's a good thing to do, but accompany it with on the tag, accompany it with a, with a, with a, 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 a product slip, product packaging, a bag, something that connects the, the product itself to the source. And the third thing I'll call out too is even uh, corporate formation. So you've got your nonprofit, you got your domain name, you filed with the Secretary of State. None of those things are necessarily trademark use. Consumers don't go to the Secretary of State and look up the roles of incorporated LLCs and, and, and nonprofits to connect goods and services to source. So that by itself too cannot necessarily provide trademark rights, even if it's still a good thing to do, even if it's part of the process. So, okay, I've already, already covered these points, so I'll go over these a little bit more quickly. So, you know, trademark rights are going to be established based on where you're using them. You want to be first to use them. Priority is always going to prevail in a trademark dispute. Um, and I want to talk now a little bit more about trademark registration and why you want to consider trademark registration. As I mentioned already, you can start putting that TM symbol on your marks from the moment you start using them. But what you cannot do is use the circle R designation unless you have a registration certificate for that mark for those goods or services. So why do you want to go through that process? Well, as I mentioned before, if you've started using that trademark and you see someone else is infringing your trademark, you're already in position to send them a cease and desist letter. And your cease and desist letter is going to have a few paragraphs up top that identify you, introduce what you're doing, you know, to describe how long you've been doing it, provide some examples. You're going to be building your case. You're going to be justifying your demand letter. This is why I have these trademark rights. This is what I've done to build my rights. The registration certificate takes those three paragraphs and condenses them down to one or two sentences. Here I am, here's my registration certificate, deal with it. It is the law, the, 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 the federal government's legal formalization of your rights, legal recognition of your rights. Uh, and anyone who then wants to challenge those rights can take it up with the trademark office. Now they can certainly do so. There's all sorts of means to cancel someone's registration or to oppose it before it registers. But once you have the registration, you have the benefit of those legal rights and the burden falls on the other side. Next, uh, next, next advantage to registration. I've talked before about how your use of the mark in California may not protect you in New York. Registration gives you rights across all 50 states, whether or not you've been to Alaska, whether or not you've been to Florida. It, can also, it will also block others from registering the same mark. Not only that, if the other side has their own attorney and has done their due diligence, simply finding your mark on the registry sends a signal. It sends, lets the world know that you have these rights, you're serious enough about your rights to have gotten the registration. And at the brainstorming stage, it can deter others from selecting your trademark. That's certainly what I do in, in the clearance process. I look to see who has registered. And if I see a registration, well, that's a red flag. That tells me, hey, you know, I don't tell you what to do. I give you a risk analysis, but I'm going to tell you that there's some high risk of using someone else's registered trademark with a similar product. And lastly, your application at the trademark office can be filed on an intent to use basis. And this is sort of the, the, the not, not quite the exception, but it's the caveat to that first to use wins uh, point I've been making. 
If you decide today you want to get an application on file for a trademark you think you're going to use, let's say in the next three to four years, that's kind of your window. You get it on file today, you go through the examination process, you get your, your what's called notice of allowance, and then you're given a period of time, starts at six months, you can extend that up to three years to prove use of the mark before you get your registration, but your rights will always date back to May 11th, to the day you filed. So even if it takes you a while to ramp up, you have placeholded your rights. You planted your flag on the rights you want to be able to exploit later. And anyone who files after today, anyone who begins using their mark after today is junior to your seniority. Now downsides are costs, first of all. Like even with, you know, if, you, if you're, you secure pro bono services for the attorney's time, you decide to file yourself. You're still going to be filing 350 bucks at a minimum at the trademark office. That's a per category fee. And I, that gets complicated, but you know, the simplest way I'll, I'll put it to you is you got a website that's providing information to people. That's one category, 350. You also print that material and you distribute it via mail. Well, printed materials, second category, 350. You also have merchandise, t-shirts, 350, tote bags, 350, jewelry, 350. So multiply what you plan on doing, what you want to have covered by 350. And that's going to be your basic fee before you know any additional fees. The trademark office will review your application. They may not grant it. They may have issues with it. Some may be formal that are easy to fix. Some might be very difficult, like someone has an earlier filing than you. Even if you get through that process, there's a 30-day window that the general public can oppose your application. So anyone who has any sort of interest in the mark can then file to oppose your application, and then you have to deal with them. And all of this may result in a negative decision for you on the record. Now, you just start using your trademark and you start getting into disputes with people. And let's say those disputes are handled between you and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. But if everyone keeps it confidential, no one outside the two of you knows what happened. You go to the trademark office though and you seek registration and the trademark office denies you or you get into an opposition and you, you either withdraw or you lose the case. Well, that's gonna be public facing. That's gonna be for the world to see. Now you get into that dispute with somebody and if they're doing their work at all, if they're doing any due diligence, they look up and see that, well, you don't really have these rights, or at least you went to bat <laughs> and you struck out. So why should I have to listen to you now if the trademark office told you that these rights are not yours to have? So I'm always going to recommend before you take that step, and honestly, before you start launching, before you start using your trademark, that you have some sort of clearance search done. Now, put that down here as a negative because that means you know some time is spent. Uh, if you're involving an attorney, there'll be costs involved with that uh, outside of a pro bono representation. So, you know, Part of the cost of doing business here is doing some homework ahead of time if you want to avoid those problems in the future. And believe me, it'll be pennies on the dollar from what you'll spend later if you get into a full-blown trademark dispute. Uh, so again, taking a breather, taking, having some water, opening the field to questions. If anybody wants to talk anything more about trademark before we get into copyright. Okay. Round up the top of an hour, so I'll try to keep this part brief. Um, but I'm happy to stay for as long as people want to hear me talk, or we can, you know, shift to more of a Q&A format. I'll leave that up to you guys. But as I talked about before, you want to have a fixed expression of an idea in some medium to have a copyright. You know, it must be of original. Uh, uh, sorry, it must be original and have some minimal uh, creativity involved. So, you know, my scribbles on a piece of paper, since I'm not. Van Gogh or Picasso are probably of minimal creativity and of, of little value and of you know, bare minimum, if any, copyright protection. Copyright like trademark is registrable, but as an option, we'll talk in a second about why you would want to register your copyright or why you should be concerned if someone else has their copyright registered. Assignable, just like a trademark, it's a product or an item. You can move from one person to another, but very critically, it must be in writing. And I'm going to hammer that point again here in a minute. Unlike a trademark, and I didn't, I didn't quite make this point before, trademarks will live forever for as long as they're being used. Copyrights, not so much. You don't have to use a copyrighted work, but a copyright will live for a certain period of time defined by the point, you know, whatever year it was created in. And once it enters the public domain, it's there for good. So how to, to make that calculation? requires a little bit of legal work since the law has changed from time to time over the years. So it depends on when we determine that the, create, that the work was created, that will then fill in the equation to figure out when it enters the public domain. 
Um, but it's a little bit complicated, so I won't generalize. And, you know, we'd have to look at it on a case by case basis. And here it is again, like all things, limited by the First Amendment. So what is protecting you against? I went through a whole spiel before about how trademark uh, infringement requires this likelihood of confusion analysis and that two people can be using the same trademark without any sort of infringement between the two. Copyright's a little simpler in that copyright protects you against anyone using your copyrighted work without your permission in basically any way for any purpose. It protects against copying of the work, reproducing the work without, without the owner's permission, displaying the work. Uh, you know, the reason why you could purchase a, a, a Blu-ray or DVD, but that doesn't mean you can project it on the side of a wall and invite, you know, the public over and sell tickets. Translation of the work or other derivative works. So, you know, if I were to, to transcribe the, the, the script to, you know, the latest Doctor Strange movie and do my own stage production of it this weekend, I might have involved all sort of creative steps in that process, but Marvel, Disney certainly own the rights to the story uh, and can prevent me from doing my own stage adaptation of the play. But they do not, copyrights do not protect the resale of the specific uh, copies of the work. First sale doctrine is what it's called. It allows you as the purchaser of a specific DVD, of a specific novel, a specific painting, to do with that painting that item as you will. Nothing against put, posting it on eBay to resell it. Again, commentary and criticism. These rights are not meant to prevent other people from speaking. They protect the, 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 the rights of the, of the, of the speaker, of the, of the copyright owner, but the, the First Amendment also allows us to, with certain limits, post images in order to critique and comment on them, post snippets, post uh, clips from a movie in order to comment upon it. Uh, that's fair use, that's a, a type of fair use, although there are others. And then lastly, I don't wanna, I wanna hammer this point too, too much because I don't think it comes up that often, but the funny thing about copyright is it doesn't prevent other people from independently creating something that might be you know, nearly identical or even identical, as long as there wasn't access to the original work. So you know, if you write a novel and it's in your basement and you never really shown anybody, maybe your neighbors, and they find out somebody down in, in Tallahassee wrote effectively the same book, <laughs> but did so without any access to your materials. You don't have a very strong copyright claim there because you have no evidence that they ever saw your work in the first place. You know, there's no uh, telepathy exception here. You have to actually have access to the work for someone to have infringed your copyright through you know, their own independent creation of the work. A um, couple points I want to make here quickly. Um, an original work uh, that it has that receives copyright protection, um, you know, notwithstanding my last point, it must be something original to you. Uh, there must be some creativity applied to it, which for a nonprofit might mean, let's imagine that you have some database of donors, uh, of members, you know, their contact information. You don't have copyright to the fact of their name, to their email address, to their phone number. But there can be some rights to the collection, the database, the arrangement of that uh, uh, information. If there's some, you know, some organizing principle behind it, aside from, you know, the most the most simple, um, they may be organized by, you know, most likely to donate again or something like that. So something like that might might apply a certain might might layer a certain copyright on top of what would otherwise not be protectable. It must be fixed. That's just to say that, you know, the, the fixed point is that uh, uh, um, live speaking that isn't recorded has no copyright to speak of because there's nothing fixed about that. And human made, uh, this is just, you know, maybe it's more for comedy's sake, but um, there have been cases in court and at the copyright office uh, on, on, on the latter finding that a selfie taken by a monkey doesn't protect, is, is not protected by copyright because there was no human involved in the process. Uh, so that image there taken by that creature is in the public domain by default. Uh, and likewise, an AI created work uh, has no human made component to the end product. Uh, even if a human wrote the AI code, the AI then produced work that has no copyright attached to it. So sorry, monkey, sorry, data. But beyond that, the fixed point is broad. 
photos, videos, web design and layout. Music has multiple different copyrights attached to it that we'll talk about. Uh, basically anything in the visual arts, anything written. If you are having anyone cre create any sort of content for the purpose of the organization's use, you have to be thinking about whether or not there is copyright attached to that work. And therefore, if there, there is copyright, there's a copyright owner. Critical point here, copyright attaches at the point of creation and it attaches on behalf of the creator with only a couple of exceptions. If you're an employee creating work as part of your job, as you know, within the, 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 the description, within the job description, then the employer is the owner from the get-go. The other situation in which that happens is if you have signed, the creator has signed a work for hire agreement as a contractor or subcontractor, not as employee, except that the work for hire uh, in the section in the provision in that, in that situation only applies in very specific circumstances defined by statute. So for you, critical point here to keep in mind is that either it's being done by you, know, you or an employee, in which case it can belong to the employer, or if it's done by uh, anyone outside the organization, you have to consider if, it, if the work for hire provision might apply, it applies in fairly narrow circumstances. So I wouldn't rely on that out of the gate without talking to a lawyer, or the, you have to assume that the creator owns the copyright and you might be getting a license to use it, or they might be assigning it to you depending on what you agreed with them and agreed to in writing, but be very clear about what you are getting. Are you getting permission to use it, but the rights remain with them? Or are you seeking ownership to control forever and ever after that, what is done with what you have acquired from them, you know, either on a volunteer basis or for pay? One last time, in writing, uh, you come to me and tell me about your, you know, the conversation you had, the handshake, maybe even the email exchange. I'm going to ask, what did they put pen to paper and sign? You know, other things here you want, really want to keep in mind. So I, I, it looks like we're up against 3.30 or the end of the hour here. So uh, Penelope, I'll, I'll just keep talking until you tell me to stop. Uh, we do have plenty yeah, more to no, cover here. Feel free, John. I think you can just keep going. People can drop off if they have to, but feel free to keep going. We don't have a hard stop. So Great, great. Um, a few things here I want to flag about copyrightable works because there's a lot of easy pitfalls you can fall into. Uh, first off, Copyright can apply to the additions made to pre-existing work. So I'm going to call out this example, what could possibly be more in the public domain than the Bible? Uh, so you may see this and think, well, I mean, Robert Crumb doesn't own any rights to Genesis. That's this, the book of Genesis is clearly out in the public domain. But he added illustrations. He added commentary. He added content on top of and interpreting the book of Genesis. Those are copyrights that'll be owned by R. Crom or you know, whoever he assigned those rights to. A single work can have multiple joint authors. Here I'm gonna call out a favorite of mine, Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchard's Good Omens. Now, the way it works with, with joint owners, there are some rules by default by law, and then there's gonna be rules or, or, or certain things you need to consider that they may have agreed between them. Meaning that, let's say you wanted to acquire the rights or you wanted to, uh, to, to, to purchase the copyright to this book, you may have an agreement with Neil Gaiman, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Terry Pratchett doesn't have rights that come into play either by contract or by law that might complicate matters. So understand, making sure that you know everyone involved in the creation of a work is gonna be important when it comes to licensing and securing rights. And here I wanna talk more about music because music may be the most complicated of all. When you have a song, unless I suppose it's you know, free jazz improv, there's a composition underlying it. So rights begin with who wrote the words and the music to the work. And that can be two, three, four people, it could be a number of people. Separate rights will apply to the recording of that song. And plenty of people have recorded Let It Be, but this will take the Beatles recording, will be owned by somebody. And those will be two coexisting rights in the single work. So if you wanna use the song, Let It Be, but you gotta think about clearing those rights, both in terms of the recording itself, but also the underlying composition. And just to make it even more complicated, let's say you want to use a video clip of their live performance on the, the rooftop of Apple Studios. Well, now you have a, a third set of rights to consider, and there may be multiple people who have interest in that synchronization and the, the, the putting of sound to video. So 
depending on what it is you want to do, you want to record a cover version of the song. Well, you know, let's, let's talk about the composition rights. You want to use the pre-recorded version by the Beatles? Well, you know, a whole bundle of rights there. You actually want to feature a video featuring the song being played live. The key, the, 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 the critical first step is going to be identifying who you need to talk to, who you need permission from, because missing any step along that trail could mean that all the work you've done securing 95% of the, the rights holders here may be sunk because that 5% is out there and vocal and coming after you. And copyright damages are no joke. Um, they can be, they can fall under two basic categories. You can either seek in the US actual, what are called actual damages, which can include both the money that they claim they, they lost through your misuse of the copyrighted work, but also the profits, you know, whatever they can attribute to what you made off of the misuse of their work. Or there can be, they can claim statutory damages provided they had their registration in place in a timely manner. And you can see that those, those ranges there are pretty, pretty stark. And then starting at 750 to 30,000 per infringed work. And that's assuming uh, that, that's, that's before we consider willfulness. So, you know, starting at a floor of 750 to 30,000, but going up to six figures, $150,000 by statute for what, you know, if it's determined that you were infringing the work willfully, intentionally. So the reason why you wanna be very, very careful about using someone's copyright, perhaps in, in some ways even more careful than trademark infringement, where damages can be, you know, a, a, little, a little, a little fishier, a little, a little, uh, a little, a little, a little slippy, slipperier. That's a word. Uh, copyright damages uh, can hit you like a ton of bricks. So, talking about copyright registration, I mentioned before it is optional. Uh, it's typically inexpensive, at least at the at the government level. Uh, the filing fees to get a copyright registered it can be in the low hundreds. And the review process at the Copyright Office can be fairly minimal. Um, and in the, the importance of doing, uh, of getting a copyright registration is if, if you have any expectation that you might need to enforce your rights, well, if you in, register your copyright within a certain time period, I think it's three months after its first publication, and publication is a, uh, a legal term, or prior to the, the infringement, the, 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 the actual infringing activity by another person, then you'll have access to those statutory damages. More importantly than that, perhaps, though, is that in recent years, the Supreme Court uh, has, de has decided that registration was actually a prerequisite to going to court. So optional though it may be, copyrighted content is you know, maybe rife within your organization. You might have any number of brochures, pamphlets, mailers, website content, you might be creating videos. You might have so much content that seeking registration is impractical. But if there is anything in that bucket, you know, anything in your portfolio of copyrighted works that you may want to enforce in the future uh, that are important enough to the organization that you want to prevent others from misusing it. Well, at this point now, registration uh, is almost always going to be a requirement to let the other side know that you're serious, to let the other side know that there's a real threat of litigation. Because without the copyright registration, uh, you're not allowed to go to court. Now, downsides here, it can be time consuming, um, mostly because oftentimes it's not always clear or the records are not always in one place uh, to, to fill in all the information you need in a copyright application. Uh, that's going to include you know, authorship, time of creation, uh, to have a full uh, uh, deposit copy ready to file. Um, and in the process of filling out that list, you might bring to light ownership issues, legal complications that otherwise might have gone unnoticed. I want to talk about my legal versus practical distinction from earlier. Now, if you're using the work and no one is complaining about it and no one's infringing it, then you know the, the, the best advice from a practical standpoint might be, you know, don't, 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 uh, don't fix it if it ain't uh, broken. But then in the course of reviewing the matter and digging through your files, it can come to light as a result that, well, we don't actually have the rights to use this. Or, you know, we, we commissioned it from someone, we paid them, that's all well and good, but we thought we owned it when in fact we're maybe at best a licensee. So, you know, just something to keep in mind that you look under a rock, you should be prepared to deal with what you see. And as I mentioned, there's a, a fairly minimal review process typically at the Copyright Office, but it's not nothing. So you can run into situations where the Copyright Office determines that what you submitted is not, is not actually registrable. 
And that goes back to the AI situation and the monkey selfie situation. So just to call it out that there's no guarantee that you have the copyrights you think you have. Now on personality rights, uh, here's gonna be a, fairly, a pretty brief skim. And the reason being that, as I mentioned before, rights of publicity, rights of privacy, what's sometimes called personality rights, they're determined on a state-by-state -state basis. So there's not a whole lot that I'm able to generalize. Uh, the big takeaway here is that, you know, if you want to use someone's name, image, likeness, uh, know where you are doing it, what state law would apply, and then we can look at it through that lens to determine what you need to do to, 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 to keep you safe from any blowback. It's typically focused, you know, just broadly here on what we deem commercial use. And I'm using commercial here fairly broadly, uh, just to draw the distinction between you know, vacation photos, you know, personal use, um, maybe educational uses, but, you know, we're really looking at uh, um, um, use by organizations, entities for profit, nonprofit, not so concerned about that distinction, and more concerned about more like an, uh, from a trademark scam, a similar trademark perspective, are you using someone's name and image in the conveying of goods and services? And the, 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 distinct, the, the, the rules can be different for someone who is a public personality versus a non-public personality. And again, that just kind of goes back to some of the state law distinctions and I'll call out one here in a little bit. Um, but it may also apply to the deceased, but only in certain states. In certain states, you might not have the same rights to protect against, you know, as the estate of a deceased person, the use of their name, image, and likeness. Um, but I, I would never rely upon that without talking to an attorney thinking about the state you're in, uh, since you know no one's going to come after you for using Cleopatra in honor of the deceased Egyptian ruler, the Cleopatra Foundation, you're probably fine, all, all other things being equal. But you're so inspired by Rosa Parks, you want to start the Rosa Parks Foundation, um, or you want to name it after someone uh, who may have been you know, an 1800s figure, they might still have a uh, family, they might still have interest in that name. Uh, so again, not something to take for granted. Um, here again, on a very general level, it can be waived uh, by people and it can be waived with fairly minimal notice. Uh, you might be in situations where the, good, the better rule of thumb is to have people's names and signatures if they're appearing on film, make sure you have a signed release from them. Uh, you may find yourself in situations like that, again, going back to New York where you happen to pass through a scene and someone wants to make sure that they have your name down and sign it so they don't have to blur out your face when they show your clip on, you know, uh, the Eric Andre show or something like that. It's an ambush television show. But other times it might be that you just happen to walk by a sign that they're relying upon that is putting you on notice that you're in an area that is being recorded. And just to say it again, all things being equal are, are, are limited by the First Amendment. Now, here, look, I, this is kind of a scare tactic on my part. This is just to let you know that there will be law to interpret depending on the state you are in. Uh, this chunk of text, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but you see here that the, the, the New York right of privacy provision is focused on advertising purposes, use of someone's name for purposes of trade. It gives without, unless you have their written consent, means to take action, to shut down operations through equitable action to seek damages from you, exemplary damages, money, to take money out of your pocket for the misuse of their name without written consent and advertising. They recently expanded the law to include deceased personalities. Now I use the word personality, not person, that's a defined term, um, with, with statutory damages available here. Uh, let's see, limited, uh, liable to the injured party or parties in an amount equal to the greater of $2,000 or the compensatory damages suffered by the injured party. So kind of going back to that similar copyright actual versus statutory damages. And here we have deceased personality defined. So you'd have to know what, how, how this, that particular state is defining that particular term to know whether or not it applied in your situation. And they'll have their own exceptions built in sometimes, like in this case, it's not a violation of this subdivision. If it's in a creative work, if it's in a uh, work of public, political, educational, or newsworthy value. I mean, those are pretty wide nets, but they're going to be subject to interpretation. It's, it's, it's not something you want to necessarily casually rely upon without having an attorney looking at it and, just, and giving you some guidelines as to what's going to be safe and what's likely going to run you into trouble. So I've been dropping First Amendment bombs throughout this whole lecture. I want to take a little, a little bit of a closer look at it to give you a little bit more of a shape, a little bit more form what that means. Uh, first, we're going to visit our friend uh, Anakin, 
uh, who very casually tells uh, his, uh, his girlfriend, I'm going to go use someone else's intellectual property without permission. And I'm going to rely on fair use. After you run that by an attorney, right? After you run that by attorney, uh, you can see her exasperation and then that bottom right square because the fair use analysis, analysis uh, though, though easy terms to toss around and you may have heard them before and you may see them on you know, YouTube disclaimers or, 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 or whatnot, um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. There's a lot of angles you have to consider before you can conclude safely that you'd have a defense if you were, you know, hauled into court, if you're responding to a demand letter. You need to consider, and I'm just going to rattle them off. This is just, you know, just basic boilerplate law at this point. The purpose and character of the use. What are you using the infringed work for? What is the nature of the work itself? How much of that work are you using? And what's the effect on the market value of that work? I mean, these are all very, very fact-specific analyses. Um, you're not going to be able to, to throw out any sort of one-size-fits-all uh, answer here. And as you might imagine, anybody who disagrees with you will be able to nitpick each one of these points. And there's not going to be a clear answer. And there wouldn't be unless you took this thing all the way up to the Supreme Court, I guess. Um, as seems to be the case with a... Uh, I think there's an Andy Warhol painting that is uh, making its way up to the Supreme Court. So we might have new guidance on this at the end of the year, um, whenever they, they render a decision on that. But for now, uh, just keep in mind that if you're going to go all in on a First Amendment defense, uh, just make sure that you understand how shaky the ground can be underneath you. Now, a term you might, get, might see tossed around a lot in this context is transformative. So if you're looking for a guiding star, for First Amendment protections for copyright against copyright infringement. I think the, the, the key takeaway term is transformative. What does that mean? Well, you know, ask a judge. But it, it basically comes down to, is there enough space? Is there enough air between what is the, the copyrighted work and what you are doing? Do you have a credible case to be made that you have transformed the work into something else? And I can't be any more specific than that because it really requires on the facts of the situation. But if you understand that copyright is there to protect against unauthorized copying, then what you do must not be a copy of it, even if it has certain elements copied from it. I don't know if, I, if there's any way to put it any clearer than that because it's really going to matter, uh, to depend on the circumstances. Now, fair use elements in the trademark context would be quite different. We mentioned before, Using a term descriptively, even if it's the exact same trademark, is perfectly fine. Talk about your apples, how much you love eating them. You're not going to get a demand letter from Apple Inc. If you're using the trademark properly, you may do so to identify the product. Again, I want to talk about my Apple laptop and you know the, the, the things I like about it, the things I don't. I'm not going to put an Apple logo at the top of this video. I'm not going to imply any, uh, uh, I'm only going to identify it as, you know, you use as much as I need to, to identify what this is, maybe product, serial number, uh, or, or whatnot. Um, and I'm not going to say anything in this video that implies that Apple endorses this video, that I'm an employee of Apple, that I'm doing so with their permission. I am doing so as a reviewer, as a commentator, uh, but I need to use the term Apple in order to identify the product, nominative fair use. In a creative work, you might have a little more flexibility. And here I'm going to use the example of the social network. Now, throughout the social network, by necessity, they are referring to Facebook. They decided not to create a fake social media company as a stand-in. They are talking about Zuckerberg. They are talking about Facebook. Under the Rogers test, which is another First Amendment protection court created by the courts, a trademark used in a creative work will not be infringing the trademark rights of the owner, provided that it has any artistic relevance to the work. The threshold on that is pretty low, but a movie about Facebook will pretty much guarantees that the, the, the Facebook trademark will be artistically relevant to the subject matter. And does it explicitly mislead as to source? Well, I don't recall anywhere in social network that they said, oh, you know, brought to you by Facebook, Facebook presents. Um, there was no, you know, slide at the end saying, you know, Facebook endorses this movie. And in context, in context, it would be hard to assume any viewer of the movie thought to themselves as they watched it, oh, 
Facebook must love this movie. <laughs> Facebook must have had a hand in the creation of this movie. So it, it is very contextual, the analysis. Um, and this is really more isolated to the creative works field, which you might have. You might be you know, in, in creating creative works in the context of your organization. And if so doing, then you might be able to play a little bit more with other people's trademarks under the Rogers test. That's not going to be the case though for non-creative works. A slippery distinction there, but you know, I'm only calling that out to say that if you're not creating social network, if you're not making a fictional work, if it's something more documentary, if it's something more about critique or commentary, then you want to think more about the, the bullet point above them and make sure you're using their trademarks in a proper and, and permitted way. Baseline here, if in copyright, the issue was whether or not you are transforming the work in some way that distinguishes it from the underlying work. In the trademark area, you're really asking yourself, is it going to be confusing to people? When people see this, is there, credible, is there a credible argument to be made that my use of someone else's trademark will make the average person think that there is a connection between us, that we are affiliates, uh, one is endorsing the other or sponsoring the other, or is it clear when I'm talking about someone else's trademark that I'm doing so in order to make commentary upon it? Or that I'm using it in a descriptive, using the term in a descriptive way that has nothing to do with this other company. Now, I didn't have, create a slide here for right of publicity along these lines, but all of these elements can come into play in similar fashion. And you're gonna want to be asking yourself similar questions. If I'm using this person's name and image, is it clear that I'm doing so to make a comment upon this person? So you put up, you know, President Obama or President Trump, and you are commenting, you're, pre you're presenting some sort of message to the people uh, about a point of view about that person. Well, odds are people won't assume that there's an affiliation there if you are attacking the person in an ad. If you're using the person's image, but you have transformed it in such a way uh, that, you know, just calling out a previous case that I won't get into the details of, but you've taken the Three Stooges and you create a, a sculpture around an image of, uh, of them and that sculpture presents them in a certain way that, well, you have now taken the original image of this character and you've created something distinct that is separable and has air between that and you know, the original work and your creative work. So right of publicity rights can function in much the same way with much the same First Amendment protections. But when I tap the sign again, I said at the beginning and when I say it now, um, but everybody does it is not a legal defense. Actually, I think I might have forgotten to say this up top, so I'll say it twice now. You can't simply rely on the fact that everybody does it any more than you can rely on the fact that everybody speeds on the highway means that you get to break the speed limit. That's not the way it works in the law. Now, you know, practical analysis may differ. Your practical analysis may be that, hey, I'm prepared to take that risk because I see so many people doing it that I don't think I'll be the one targeted. I don't think I'll be the one pulled over by the cops. But the one, if, if pulled over, pointing around and saying everyone else is speeding, is not gonna get you very far. The only context in which it might, and maybe others, but the one that comes to my mind is in the trademark context. And I said before, enforcement is required. If you're not enforcing your trademark, you can lose those rights. And someone comes at, after you with a trademark infringement claim, Pointing to the fact that they have not enforced their trademarks against a dozen, a hundred other infringing parties may get you somewhere. Okay, so we've now hit, we're coming up on an hour and a half. What I have next is a, is a hypothetical scenario, um, which I'm happy to go through, but I have been talking for almost 80, 90 minutes now. So, you know, I'm going to leave it to Penelope if you want an off-ramp here. I'd be happy to, to close up here, uh, take any questions you want to you ask now and call it a day, or I can keep going. You can keep going um, if you want. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to do so. I'm going to uh, uh, refresh one last time. Uh, if anybody has any questions now about anything at all I've just talked about. Okay, so we're going to go into our hypothetical then. Uh, forgive my acting skills. Uh, so imagine that uh, someone just came into my office and they're here to you know, lay out their troubles to me. I really want to trademark helping people. It's a name I've been using for a few years now. I was inspired by a book that I read by that, you know, that, that famous motivational speaker, you know, the book, Helping People, that book. I hope she doesn't mind that I dropped the 
entire first chapter of her book on my website, it's helping-people.org. I didn't attribute the quote to her. Do you think I should? I just, I really want people to know that she inspired me to help people uh, and also sell merchandise, t-shirts and stuff. So that's what happens. Uh, what happens next? Well, in my hypothetical, I get to, to control both sides of the conversation. So first I'm going to talk to this person about the trademark, the trademark of helping people. Um, I want to ask myself out of the gate, is that a minimally distinctive phrase? It's not generic. I mean, maybe it is generic, actually. Depends on what we're talking about. Um, is it, and is it available as a source indicator for specific goods or services? So starting off with distinctiveness, is it distinctive? Is it not generic? Um, helping people for the service of helping people. Now, anytime I can use the mark itself to describe the services you're providing, that's a red flag. Uh, now we're in generic territory. Uh, you don't wanna be able to use your name to also describe what it is you are doing, not so exactly. One-to-one um, -one is, you know, is, is, is not the best place to be. Um, but, you know, you can see I got a second thought here, but helping people as a brand for merchandise, well, now you're more suggestive maybe, now maybe even arbitrary. So it can really matter the goods and services that you're providing, whether or not the, the, you know, the, the, the mark you have in mind, the phrase you have in mind is going to function as a trademark. Is it available? Well, this is kind of tricky now, isn't it? Now, I'm not even going to talk about the book. I'm not even going to talk about the writer. First thing I'm just going to let you know is that, well, I did a little trademark search at the trademark office using their publicly available online database. Uh, and this is a pretty blunt approach, just looking for the exact same phrase. But that by itself came up with nearly 200 records that I'd had to parse through. Um, and I'm not seeing the exact, the, 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 the five, let's just take the five up top. The five hits up top, none of them were helping people full stop. It's helping people within some larger phrase. Now, that might mean that helping people is so commonly used by so many different organizations that it might be available for another entity to use because no one of these parties has broad exclusive rights to the phrase helping people by itself. It might also just signify, though, that it's, as my first point, I was concerned about its distinctiveness. That's maybe it's just not a distinctive enough phrase because other people are using it in this descriptive manner as well. And a word about that author. So um, let's say, uh, hold on, you want to use someone's book title as your organization's name. Now, funny thing about book titles, a single book title by itself is not a trademark. If J.K. Rowling had stopped at Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone or the Sorcerer's Stone, whatever, and that was it, it tanked, it was just one book on the shelf. Well, there'd be no empire, there'd be no branding, there'd be no series. The one title by itself wouldn't have trademark protection and someone else could come along and call their book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, uh, surely as certain titles are simply common to books and they come out every so often. And, one author doesn't get to you know, challenge the other author. They just put a bracket with a year after it to distinguish that this is so-and-so book 2022, not so-and-so book 1985. But if this person who wrote this book also provides a lecture series, also provides, also released a sequel, also releases, also sells merchandise, well, I'd want to take a very close look at that because if there's a motivational speaker out there, they tend to have those things. They might have built a brand around that trademark. So it might not be available, you know, all other things being equal because this person has priority. Because if there are any trademark rights to be had, this person would have them, not, not my client. Now, another thing I want to talk about is, well, okay, so let's just say you want to use the phrase then. Okay, you want to use the phrase. Um, okay, so... The, going back to my Harry Potter example, uh, the Expectrum, Expecto Patronum, one something like that. They, there's a, there's a, a, a spell told within the movie Harry Potter, uh, and it is very close to this pun, Espresso Patronum, uh, which this coffee company filed to register. 
uh, and they've gotten slapped with an opposition from Warner Brothers, and now they're in a dispute with this, or Warner Brothers or whoever is claiming the rights to those Harry Potter properties, uh, and they're now in a public dispute at the trademark office, and presumably someone will win and someone will lose, and I, I would place bets on, uh, on, uh, on, on this coffee company being on the wrong side of that. But why did they go to the trademark office? They wanted to go to the trademark office because they wanted to, as they, this person does, quote unquote, trademark their name. Trademark rights can come through use. You don't have to go get your mark registered. Doing so has its advantages. And one of those rights is exclusive rights, the presumption of being the only one, exclusive rights to use the mark. Here's the problem with that, a couple of problems with that. One, I was able to find Espresso Patronum in pretty common use by a lot of different people. These are not all the same source. So it's a common enough pun that you already see it out there being used by tons of people. Now, was this guy who filed this application the first of them? And this is just his step towards enforcing those rights against all these copycats? I mean, maybe, but odds are that, well, no, it's just kind of out there in the, out there in the world. You know, lots of people are using it. And he could have been one of them. This, how this he or she, this coffee company could have been one of them. They could have been one of them. Um, but instead they stuck their neck out, tried to seek registration and got caught the attention of a behemoth of a company that is very interested in strongly protecting the Harry Potter brand. Now, does this motivational speaker have Warner Brothers pocketbook? I have no idea. I don't wanna find out. If you can use your helping people name and they'd be none the wiser and you would just be one of the hundreds of people using helping people, maybe that's the better way to go, legal versus practical. Is it better off staying under the radar? I mean, ideally, I guess, the goal of all trademarks is to become well-known, but well-known can come with a cost and it can be the wrong kind of attention. So client says, yeah, but I got my domain name. Well, we talked about this, right? The helpingpeople.org means you can use helpingpeople.org. It's, it's more like an address in that sense. You don't own your street name. It just helps you help people to find you. And the helpingpeople.org is not really going to help you. If anything, you might be concerned that the motivational speaker might come after you if, now we didn't talk a lot about this or at all yet, but you can use trademark rights to acquire or cancel someone else's domain name if there's a likelihood of confusion, if there's bad faith involved, if the motivational speaker files what's called a UDRP complaint, claims some trademark rights to helping people, has reason to argue that the helpingpeople.org was a bad faith uh, uh, acquisition by your client, by my client, um, that results in confusion. Well, I'm listing off the elements here of a successful UDRP complaint. So not only does that domain name not guarantee that you have any rights, but it may make you a target of someone else who has better rights than you. And not only that, here, I'll just, by way of example, down at the bottom, there's a little disclaimer. I'm not advising you to go to this website. I think it's perfectly benign. I think, but it's, it's, it's not affiliated with the party you would think. RoyalDutchShellPLC.com doesn't belong to the Shell Oil Company. It is a, 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 a what's, I think what's called a gripe site. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a site that exists in order to criticize the company. Now there are First Amendment protections if this were to come up in the United States that allows you to acquire a domain name for purposes of criticizing a brand. Uh, but the point here being that there's no claim that could possibly be made by the owner of this gripe site to the Shell brand. So that domain name doesn't really get you anything except for the right to use that domain name, that, that question mark. So what are you going to do? So I'm going to tell my client, look, don't panic. Nothing that you're doing right now requires you to shift gears at all. You, you haven't received a demand letter. No one's coming after you. You're not in any. You're not under the gun in any way. But you might want to consider rebranding. You might want to consider pivoting at least that brand a little bit. And ideally, you want to have a few options in mind. Uh, the ideal situation in my, from my, from where I'm sitting, is having a client with three or four brands that they could live with, three or four brands they could even be excited about. And that allows me to then review and rank and give you some perspective on, you know, from a relative perspective, hey, this, this mark might be your best shot. These other two marks, they might be a little more problematic, but doable, but take, take this fourth one off the list. 
Um, I'm going to actually skip this point, basically to say that, you know, using someone else's copyrightable material, it doesn't really matter if you are properly attribute it or not. Just simply saying this quote is from so-and-so doesn't exempt you from copyright infringement. Uh, a few words about fair use is, I'm going to skip it. Um, and once you are ready with a brand that you think you can live with, that you'd be excited about pivoting towards, that we have cleared and is available, possibly even registrable, I want to have a conversation with you about what you are after here. If you're trying to spread the message that helping people is good, then the goal might be to spread that message, not to control or own the message. If the, if the goal is to attract people to your website, to have search engine optimization, to have a name that you can protect and prevent others from using, well, then that's going to steer us towards perhaps option A, perhaps option B. And circling back, <laughs> uh, contrary to everything I said about domain names, I suppose, uh, they are good and they are important. And you want to have them once you have your brand name in mind, uh, because I guess to complement my point, anyone can acquire those domain names, the .nets, the .orgs, the .coms. Uh, and, you know, if you can pick it up for a few bucks now, or even, you know, a, a lot of bucks, if it's a worthwhile domain name, best to do so as soon as you have your domain, your, your trademark in mind, uh, because nothing stops someone else from picking it up uh, ahead of you in time. And where I think about registration as an option, but it's not a fait accompli, it's not necessarily the right move for you. We're going to, you know, again, consider the big picture and what your goals are. Um, so through that process, we land on the name Hell People. Oh, that's a lot off my mind. And I took the passage from her book off the website. And in its place, I embedded a video from Instagram that I asked one of my employees to make. Well, it's actually a subcontractor, but I did pay him for it. He performed a live reading of that passage from her book in Central Park. And he had this busker behind him playing a cover version of that song by Warren Play, Fixing You. Uh, but don't worry, he, he, he rephrased the passage from the book. So we're, we're good. He didn't exactly copy the book. So, okay, so I got to unpack this quite a bit because first you start off saying it was an employee who created this content. If, if, it, if it was an employee, then maybe we're talking a clean case of work for hire and you, the employer, uh, the, the entity owns the video. Uh, but if you hired someone, whether or not you paid them, I'm more concerned about whether what would you, agreement you have with them in writing. And it may be an assignment that you have their signature on that assigns the rights to you. It might be a license, but I want to sort that out. And you repost it from their Instagram account. Now, we haven't talked about this at all, but ah, boy, reposting from Instagram can be very tricky. Uh, lawsuits have been filed over this. Uh, simply because someone posts something to one website doesn't mean that they've granted anyone permission to repost that, that, that content anywhere else. The photographer, a videographer, the performer, they might have rights that they have licensed to Instagram that they have not licensed to you. So don't assume that you can repost from any social media uh, platform. And it's a live reading. So, you know, they bought the book, they own the book, they're reading from the book out loud. You're kind of veering into a public performance, a display of the work. A display of the work was one of those uh, categories of copyright uh, protection that I rattled off before. So you might still be infringing that author's rights by this recorded live recording. I mean, audio books are a thing, right? So, you know, simply reading the book out loud doesn't skirt the copyright in the, the print. Now, it was rephrased. It wasn't a word for word reading. Well, I would, want to, I would want to know how much it was rephrased. I would want to know how far away it is from the original material before I tell you that the rephrasing gets you anything. Now you got this performer in the background too. You got someone playing a song. Well, that just opened up this huge Pandora's box of copyrights that we talked about before, the composition rights to the song. Now, maybe the band that performed the famous version of that song don't really have a say in it and you, you covering that song. There might be a compulsory license to the, the, the composition. Um, but that doesn't mean you have rights to then record, to synchronize a performance of that song in the video. There may be rights held by the busker himself, by the person performing the song. And these might be layered inter intertwined rights that create a huge headache for everyone involved to try to sort out, well, who do we even go to to seek permission to have the song featured in this video that we're putting on our website using in a commercial manner? And you're in Central Park. Well, now I got to think about who might be in the background? Who else is featured? Backs of heads, you know, slivers of faces, I'm not going to be super concerned about. 
that camera starts to pan over and you're collecting testimony from people, you know, perhaps in support of your cause. Well, what permission have you gotten to record those people? So anyway, there's a lot to be done here, but here we're gonna to jump to act three. I can't believe it. That author sent us a cease and desist letter. And that's after we changed the branding from help people to hell people. We removed that video from our website and every other reference to her from our website. We retweeted some of her posts and, that, and some of those posts had photos of her. Uh, and I still name her as a personal inspiration in my profile on the website. She says our name is still confusing, that basic concepts of our mission have too much in common with her guidance. And she doesn't like that we identify her anywhere on our website. Well, plenty here that we could dive into. I'm just going to start by saying don't panic if you get a demand letter. A demand letter is not a lawsuit. You haven't been dragged into court. You think about a demand letter as an opening and offer to negotiate. It's a business discussion. They are asking for certain things from you and you're in a position to respond or ignore or concede or fight back. Secondly, I'm going to say the first thing you want to do before responding is talk to an attorney. Don't say anything publicly about it. Don't respond right away unless you want to confirm receipt. But even confirming receipt, I might say, well, hold on before you do that. What is the goal here? What are we trying to accomplish? How do we want to position ourselves in this negotiation? Do we want to be friendly? Is this someone you might actually perceive as a, 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 a future business partner? Yeah, they, maybe they're coming in hot or you know, maybe they're coming in with more of an open hand, but either way, we might be able to pivot that conversation into, hey, what's going to be mutually beneficial to both sides of this conversation? Maybe you want to be seen as supportive of the cause that we are promoting. Maybe you don't want to seem like a bully. Maybe we can you leverage that uh, interest in your good name and face to our advantage. The point two I want to make here, uh, similarly, is consider your own goals. What is the cost benefit analysis to fighting back? As I said at the top, like most disputes end in settlement between parties. They don't go to court. And even if they're in court, they tend to settle before you have a final decision from the judge or jury. If it takes you 15 minutes to scrub your website, remove a few references, whether or not you are you know, in the right to have them up in the first place, well, then that's how you spend 15 minutes. You might decide that that's the simplest way forward. As your counsel, I'd be in no position to tell you otherwise. You're the best judge of what's a good use of your time. If these are important parts of your branding, though, if it's an important part of your messaging, well, then the time and effort you put in fighting back is you know, it's an investment in your brand. At the end of the day, you will be the judge of that, whether or not it's worth fighting back as a practical matter. And my job will be to try to give you the best guidance from a legal perspective, what I think would be the likely outcome of pushing back. And if pushback is what we do, well, then, you know, it's going to be an, uh, an issue spotting game. We're going to consider your defenses. Now, she calls out trademark infringement. Well, likelihood of confusion is a subjective test. We, we walked through some of the elements before, and that's going to be on her. Is the average consumer going to think that hell people and help people are the same? Well, you know, that's a subjective question. And you have the First Amendment on your side in that situation. It's a defense, it's yours to be proven. She has to prove her case of infringement and you can stand your ground and argue your case that whatever it is you're doing, the use of her name is permitted because it's simply naming someone as an influence. You're simply identifying them as the author of a book. You're not doing anything to confuse anyone. Anything you've done has some transformative element. All of these things, you know, we can pull out all the tools from the tool shed. And last point here, you know, just to, to, to end where we began, is that she might not like what you're doing because she thinks the idea of it is too similar to her idea. But the idea, in this case, the idea of helping people is not what's protectable. It's the manifestations of that idea. It's the creative work that you put into the brand and the movement and the website and the organization, how you do the things you're doing. That's what's going to be protectable, not the underlying basic concept. So I close there, uh, only <laughs> a mere 45 minutes longer than I think I was allocated. So 
I appreciate the people who hung on. I hope that this was uh, valuable and interesting. Uh, and though the sign says thank you, I am still fully open to any sort of questions anybody has. I don't have a question, but I just want to say thank you so much for this. It was like wonderful and fascinating and I cannot wait to watch again and I'm not kidding. Thank you. That means a lot to me. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Let's stop recording now. Okay. Okay.